Hello everybody. It's very nice but slightly weird to see you all, or at least your pixels. Um, so Kathy has told us everything we need to know, I think, for the introduction to the session. I won't repeat that. So I think we can just get started. Um, if Mohammed is ready. So should I be starting to share my screen? Um, we're we're just a little bit early, Mohammed. So, but I think that'll be okay. I think yeah, just go ahead. I think that'll be fine. Okay. And remember, you've got you've got twelve minutes, seven minutes for questions. The questions will come through the the chat line, and I'll um I'll uh, read them out to you. Okay. Okay. Since we're starting a little bit early. Uh, maybe I can do a little bit of an introduction. Go for it. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today to listen to my presentation. Uh, my title for today is uh, Morphology and Depositional Architecture of a Myosin Carbonate Platform in Central Konya, an insight from a wave pattern analysis. So this abstract, I actually made it around, I think around three to four years ago. Um, and uh, I just left it in the blue. And then I saw that there's this uh, Manchester Carbonate Forum, so it would be cool to just send this abstract and uh, voila, it's, uh, it's accepted. So, yeah, so moving on, there's uh, more, much, much more knowledge that I've gained throughout the years and much more uh, different uh, insights that I've uh, gained into that will update uh, what I present here today. But uh, basically, this paper is uh, this presentation is basically a very simplistic conceptual paper, so I hope um, you guys can uh, enjoy what I will be presenting to you today. So maybe I can start now, uh, Peter. Is it okay to start now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. All right. So can you guys see my mouse? Or should I... Yes, underneath. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Spotlight. Okay. Okay. So the particle carbonate field is basically in a uh, central cornea. Uh, it's offshore Borneo. So basically, for those of you who don't know where central cornea is, it's basically offshore eastern Malaysia. So uh, offshore Ostrava. And the particle field is basically started during growth of a big mega platform and during subsequent, uh, it grew during the middle Miocene and during the subsequent backstepping during the late Miocene, it started to backstep into smaller, I would like to call uh, micro platforms. So it's, uh, it's a huge uh, carbonate field around 25 kilometer, around 9 kilometer and the smaller micro platforms are actually around 5 to 3 and 2 by 2. So the particular gas water contact of the field, uh, if you can see my mouse, is around this particular, it's quite, quite shallow. And uh, why this micro platform is very, very important in terms of the hydrocarbon development, because most of the production wells and also the exploration wells were actually drilled uh, on top of these uh, small uh, micro platform combinations. Okay. So my focus of today will be covering the mega platform, but in particular, focus the micro platform area. So without further ado, um, I would like to read a statement by Baharin Kam in 1998. This is one of my motivation for the particular study, is that platform geometries and internal architectures are closely linked to piling wind directions. So windward margins are usually steep and remain more or less stationary through time and were probably reef line. So you can see in uh, this modern analog in Samporna Sabah over here. And leeward margins are usually uh, have bulging outlines and are much more gently sloping. So with that particular motivation in mind, I did my uh, own uh, slope analysis on the particular carbonate field. So uh, we did, I did uh, two particular sets of measurements, one in the mega platform and another in the micro platform. And I also see the different uh, internal architectures of the carbonate to see uh, if they're more inclined towards a refill type of uh, environment or more to lagoons or reworked uh, rework sediments. 
So uh, the, the measurements of the slope angles found that during the micro mega platform growth, the major orientation of the winds were actually in the northeast to north uh, direction, while during the late Miocene, somehow there's actually a change in trend where we see that the most deepest slopes were actually towards northeast and southeast. So we were wondering why uh, did, was there actually a change in the dominant uh, monsoon patterns or wave direction from uh, during the growth of the middle Miocene to the late Miocene. And we can also see uh, in the southeast portion of the reefs, we can see some uh, really nice progressional reef features uh, which actually were drilled by wells. So in terms of conceptual model, uh, during the mega platform growth, the windward margin is towards northeast and north, while during the micro platform growth is much more dominant towards the southeast, where you could clearly see these progressional refill features uh, from seismic. So moving on, uh, let's see what does uh, our regional understanding of uh, Borneo regional monsoon wind patterns tell us. So we know uh, from literature that monsoon winds actually blow from uh, colder regions into uh, warm regions. So uh, there's actually two sets of particular monsoons that are uh, basically in the South China Sea area. One is the Northwest monsoon and the Northwest monsoon actually blow, uh, blows cold air from India. And uh, this circulates to uh, across northern Erosia and as it travels into the Borneo area, it's uh, in a net direction from northeast to southwest. And some people uh, call this monsoon to be the winter monsoon, but uh, uh, in this uh, particular paper that I did, is, uh, we call it a northwest monsoon, but in, in a direction uh, in the central corner area, it's in a net northeast to southwest direction. So in the other monsoon, which is uh, uh, the southeast monsoon, uh, cold air is actually traveling from the Australia area and as it reaches the Borneo area, uh, it travels from the southwest to northeast direction. However, um, most of the monsoon or the winds uh, that are traveling from the Australia area is actually impeded by the Sumatran Strait. So there's actually a dissipation of energy uh, going on during the southeast monsoon. So in terms of uh, yearly net uh, wave energy uh, direction, we know uh, that the northeast monsoon has a great impact in the central corner area in comparison uh, to the southwest monsoon, which still has an impact but to a lesser extent than uh, the northeast monsoon, uh, northwest monsoon. Uh, and uh, this is actually a monsoon pattern of the present day conditions. However, during the middle to late Miocene, uh, plate reconstruction is roughly quite similar to the present day orientation. There's not much change going on. Uh, what we do know is uh, that it, there is actually an uh, increase in monsoon energy from middle to late Miocene. Uh, but uh, most uh, in terms of uh, direction and in terms of uh, huge, uh, the impact of the influence is uh, more or less the same. Okay. So if there's uh, no change in uh, monsoon wave direction, how did the windward margin change in the particle carbonate? So here's a top carbonate structure, uh, regional car uh, top carbonate structure of the whole, all of the fields in central Konya. And this is where I put my dominant uh, monsoon wave patterns. And if I zoom into this particular area of the, the particle field, we can see in this uh, in, this, in between these two particular fields, there exists this narrow strip that is quite, quite deep uh, between these two platforms. And how does this uh, narrow strip impact in terms of the net wave direction into the platform? I will uh, explain it more in the later slides. So going into a, a sequence uh, stratigraphic interpretation, understanding of the area, from uh, biostratigraphic uh, wells uh, data that from from biostratigraphic data from wells drilled in clastic intervals uh, in between the carbonate uh, platforms, we see that in terms of environment, there's actually a shallowing uh, in environment from the deeper stratigraphy to the younger stratigraphy, and from uh, our understanding from the global eustacy, there's actually a series of eustatic low stands 
during the cabinet growth, which resulted in uh, several sequence boundaries and uncommunities, which eroded uh, material on top of the carbonate and probably deposited it uh, around the carbonates. And uh, during the subsequent sea level fall or the final uh, sequence boundary, there was actually uh, a reaching of the prograding clastics into the area, which also contributes to the infilling of the um, material in between the carbonate bodies. And uh, we can see from our color topographic analysis, actually, uh, in the east, southeastern part of the field, uh, it's actually a little bit more shallower than the northwest part of the field. Bear in mind that uh, the analysis that I'm showing here is basically the present day structure, and uh, I'm not doing any flattening, uh, so on and so forth, to resemble what we can expect from a paleo. But uh, I would say that the uh, net strength is basically the same. Now, uh, moving on, uh, when I, we did a thickness analysis uh, of the, between the major interpretation internal carbonate reflectors inside the field, what we do see is uh, during the deeper or the earlier part of the carbonate growth, there's actually a structural trend or thickness trend that is similar to the structures or the faults that we can interpret across the field. Uh, however, once we reach the sequence boundary B to sequence boundary C, now we see that the thickness of the carbonate is much, much more uniform and we, we can uh, much more confidently say that the thickness is uh, based on uh, depositional trends. But we do see a uh, backstepping towards the northeast area. But what I would like to really highlight is the thickness between sequence boundary C and top of mega platform. So what you can see here is some very, very nice uh, karstic features uh, due to the exposure of the carbonate, due to the hard, uh, longer time of exposure time, which created some dissolution and uh, differential uncertain topography. So during uh, this uh, sequence boundary C to top mega platform, you can see that the thickness is actually reorientated in a southeast direction. So you, you know that the uh, away from uh, this uh, shallower culmination towards the northwest, northeast, and uh, here you are in uh, much more deeper conditions. And during the final uh, transgression event, uh, these uh, higher culminations or probably uh, a shallower shoal area backstep into the final smaller micro platforms that you see very nicely over here. So, with that understanding in mind, um, I just uh, make a simplistic wave propagation analysis. So what we uh, understand from waves is as waves uh, reach shallower water areas, uh, now uh, the wave base starts to influence more uh, the sea bottom and the uh, and, uh, uh, wave starts to squeeze between each other and the amplitude or the amplitude of the wave starts to increase and they become higher and higher and then the wave breaks and uh, from swash and uh, and so on that influences the shallower water areas. And as a wave travels from a deeper water to shallow water, it tends to refract towards the shallow water conditions. And if a wave is actually reaching uh, something that is impeding its flow, it will tend to diffract around it. And uh, this is got a little bit less than a minute left. Okay, just a little bit more. So. Uh, during the mega platform growth, you can see that uh, the wave is refracting towards the northeast portion of the, the carbonate and during the micro platform growth, you see the same thing. But what you do see uh, from a cross section over here is that the southeast portion of the carbonate is actually much, much more shallower than the northwest portion due to the differential in antecedent topography. So in terms of net diffraction, we will expect that we will have a higher wave energy uh, influence in the southeast portion. Thus, uh, that will be a reliable explanation why we'll get a, a better windward margin direction in this southeast portion of the carbonate uh, that we see. So that's all from me. In terms of conclusion, uh, the change in the portional pattern, windward leeward interpretation from the mega platform to the backstepping smaller platforms might be interpreted due to the change in monsoon wind direction. 
we have a difficulty to support this understanding from our original perspective or from our original analysis. But from interpretation of different data sets and this dense uh, slope analysis, sequence stratigraphy, paleoclimate analysis, paleostructures, the wave propagation analysis interprets a higher net wave energy in the southeast portion of the small platform due to the refraction towards its more shallow and sudden topography. Uh, it will be cool we, to test this concept further to numerical modeling methods such as wave modeling or forward stratigraphic modeling. Uh, we know that there are much, much uh, different, different uh, processes that are involved in a regional sense. And uh, what we focus on in this particular paper is just from a wave propagation analysis point of view. So uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much, everybody, to listen to my presentation. Let's go to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Mohamed. So um, if you have questions, now is the time to type them in the, uh, the group chat. Um, window. I've got one so far from um, Steve Stroder, so let's start with that. Steve asked, uh, on slide four, you showed a windward side on the southeast side of the platform, but also progradation on that side of the platform. You say that the windward side remains stationary through time. Uh -huh. So I think that's, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. sounds uh -huh. a little bit contradictory. Is it progradation or is it aggradation that you're seeing there? Uh, no, it's actually progradation. So what actually happened um, is during the mega platform growth, the carbonate was actually growing in quite deep water conditions. But during the micro platform or the smaller platform growth, the carbonate is actually growing on top of the top of the mega platform. So in terms of the water conditions in comparison, it's actually much, much more shallow water conditions so if you, uh, if I have uh, estimated paleo water around this particular direction, I only have that particular water depth. And uh, carbonates, uh, that's what carbonates do. Uh, when we have a limited accommodation space, uh, they tend to progress. And uh, this is what we see. And why we know that this is actually a reef line, uh, is actually we have wells drilled over here and the characteristics are very uh, similar to, to reef oil. Uh, instead of uh, grainy, uh, more leeward margin type of material. And we also see that the slopes are actually much, much steeper in this side in comparison to the leeward margin. So that, that rule about the windward side remaining stationary, are you saying that that applies to the larger scale platform when it's got a much higher relief margin? Yeah, you could say, you could say, uh, definitely say so, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, I think we have another question here that is saying, um, are there any storm deposits that you can identify uh, on this platform system? Storm deposits. Um, and that's, if you want to um, talk about storm deposits, uh, let me see. Uh, what we do see, um, if you see my slides over here, this is a uh, a cross section in another field, but it's basically still uh, around the same region of the central Luconia carbonates. Uh, you can see that uh, based on the wells drilled in the clustered intervals uh, surrounding the carbonates, there's a change in environment. And there's also a lot of reworking uh, talus materials, uh, or some people call it calcitubidites. And uh, there's a recent paper by, um, I think, um, Bernard Pearson and his team, uh, just a recent paper in 2020, uh, around this year, mentioned that during the late Miocene, uh, there's actually an increase in monsoon energy. And these uh, particular areas uh, of the shallower part of the talus or the upper part of the cluster interval could actually be affected by some drifts uh, of the paleo. Uh, of the sea bottom, so they can actually uh, rework the the particular uh, reorientation, and they can uh, produce some con convex upwards uh, uh, structures. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have a, we have another question. I think this is maybe the final one that we can do. This is from uh, Pankaj Kana. Why did the mega platform backstep? Now, there's a great question for you. What do you think? Why did it backstep the way that it did? Uh, 
that's a very, very nice question. Uh, we always have uh, these kinds of questions. Um, why did the carbon demise? Why did the carbon backstep? Um, as uh, I mentioned, this is a very nice slide to show. As I mentioned, during the subsequent uh, uh, subsequent boundary, there's actually uh, exposure time. So what happens during exposure, there tends to be dissolution and there tend to be differential dissolution around the carbonate. So what we tend to see is some areas of the carbonates uh, which are less impacted by dissolution will tend to remain higher, but some areas that are more, have properties that are being able to more uh, increase in dissolvability will tend to be dissolved and they tend to form some crusty features, some cavens and so on and so forth. So during the subsequent transgression event, the antecedent topography that remains high will tend to be uh, the zone of areas where most of the reef will uh, concentrate in. And uh, if there's a huge amount of subsidence or transgression, this will be the remaining uh, topography that will continue in terms of carbonate development. And we also, uh, I also mentioned about the increase in monsoon uh, monsoon uh, energy during this uh, late Miocene period. And what happened is, uh, during this period also, there's a huge influx of clastics uh, based on the pyro deltas during that time. And to, uh, this uh, deltas actually bring a uh, much more increase in nutrients into the area, which possibly uh, suffocate the carbonates more and uh, increase in the, in the backstepping features before it it basically died. Uh, cool. in that's, that's great. It's, a, it's yeah. like a murder mystery. Um, yeah. Okay, so we should we should move on, Aaron. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was great. Very interesting. Um, You're welcome. Next speaker then is uh, Nicholas Saspaturi. You ready to go, Hi. Nicholas? Yeah, yeah it's okay. Uh, I can share my screen. Yeah, we're still just a little bit early, but I think if you share your screen and get ready, that's good. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Um, so we have around four seconds of delay when I change the slide, so uh, no worry. We, I will take some time in between uh, each slide. So um, uh, my name is Nicolas Aspituri. So thank you to being here to listen to the presentation. Uh, this work has been done uh, on the framework of the Orogen uh, research program, uh, whose goal was to understand how the Pyrenean belt ev evolved through time from the early Cretaceous hyperextension to the uh, tertiary to Miocene compression. So uh, he, this work has been done in collaboration with the French Geological Survey, was Simon here uh, is the first author of the paper that we have submitted on that subject. So here, the presentation is talking about uh, sedimentary evolution and vertical movement of the Cenomanian to Santonian carbonate platform on the Iberian margin of the Pyrenees. So uh, as an introduction, uh, the late Cretaceous Iberian platform um, sedimentary record correspond to a shallow um, uh, platform that record tectonic key sends, uh, preceding the Pyrenean convergence. So here's the outcrop that we have studied are in green on the map to the south of the Pyrenean axial, axial zone here on brown. So we have a lot of sedimentology study, but they are very scattered. And um, here we, we will try to propose a, a presentation of all the Iberian platform evolution. And the, we have used uh, the biostratigraphical framework based on foraminifer and redist of Bilot, that is uh, very good. So the work um, is based on field work and microscopy analysis on field sample. We have defined 24 faces and uh, identified five uh, association. So we have rebuilt the evolution of the sedimentary profiles through time from the Cenomanian to the late Santonian. But today the presentation focuses on how accommodation rates evolve through time and how it records the vertical movement 
during the late Cretaceous. So here we can see the correlation transect from northeast to southwest. Uh, during so the, the, the Iberian platform overline uh, the Paleozoic basement because the Jurassic to Albion Perifed cover have glided uh, towards the north during the early Cretaceous rifting stage. So the basement has been denudated and uh, the carbonate platform um, uh, overlines the directly the basement on the Pyrenees. So during Cenomanian to Tyronean time, we have a uh, low accommodation rate. And we record a, a platform record a major regression uh, during the Coniation. And during late Coniation to uh, late Antonian, we have a major flooding of the platform and the basin. So if we have a look on the um, accommodation map, on top here, you have the accommodation map of the Cenomanian. And at the base, you have the accommodation map of Turonian. We can see that the average accommodation rate is uh, pretty low during uh, these two stage, around 10 meter per million year during Cenomanian and 20 meter per million year during the Turonian. However, we have major change during the Coniacian. Here we, you have the map of the Coniacian on top and Coniacian record a major uh, regression and immersion surface. Um, that is luckily uh, evidence uh, on the picture at the base on the left uh, by erosive surface and karstification on top of this uh, surface, paleo soil formation, and when the platform um, uh, accom was accommodated, uh, we have a lot of plastic on the platform. So on the platform, we have very uh, low accommodation rate and luckily negative value of minus two meter per million year. Um, and the basin here in blue uh, is quite uh, subsiding. We have around 100 meter per million year uh, of subsiding. During the Santonian, here you, you have the map of the Santonian. Both the platform and the basin are um, increasing with a sharply increase of the average accommodation rate around 200 meter on the platform and between uh, more than uh, 1,000 meter on the basin. So if we have a look on the key sections that we have studied, uh, on the right, we have a zoom on top of uh, the accommodation rate curve. During Cenomanian to Turonian time here, we have a low average accommodation rate value. And during Coniacian time, we have a, uh, a decrease of the accommodation rate and luckily an uplift and an immersion of the platform. And during the late Coniacian to Santonian, we have a sharp increase of the accommodation rate on both the platform and the basin. So here it's synthetic map from Cenomanian, Turonian, Coniacian and Santonian. Um, the point to the south correspond to uh, the point of the study area and the point to the north correspond to bibliography section. So if we have a look on what happened on the basin here on the dark uh, point here, uh, we have this curve. So here the correlation between uh, the edge from Turonian to late Santonian are got uh, tricky because microfossil are not always very good, but what we can see is that we have a um, relatively uh, homogeneous sedimentation rate during Cenomanian to Turonian and a sharp increase of uh, sedimentation rate since the Coniacian. So if you try to compare how we record uh, the evolution of the accommodation on the platform to what we know in Miller and Ack curve. Um, during the Coniacian, the sedimentary record demonstrate opposite trends of accommodation rate evolution with an uplift of the proximal margin and a huge subsidence on the basin. So here we have a look on regional variation and no global uh, view. And during Santonian, Ack and Miller curves show relatively low a static um, level, which should lead to 
low to negative accommodation space. However, on our platform, um, sedimentary record demonstrates a very strong uh, increase of accommodation rates. So it seems that long-term accommodation variation are not correlated with the static variation. So uh, during Coniacian to Santonian time, accommodation evolution on the Pyrenees cannot be only explained by astasy. So here we have the models that we propose from the evolution of the late Cretaceous Cavern platform on the Pyrenees. During Cenomanian to Turonian time, it's a sketch at the base. We have a very low accommodation space, both on the margin and on the basin. So here we record the post reef thermal subsidence for allowing the early Cretaceous hyperextension stage that is responsible here for exhumation of the mantle in green and at the base of the basin. During Coniacian to mid Santonian time, we have an uplift of both the southern margin study area and the northern margin, uh, thanks to bibliography um, observation. Salt tectonic here on the margin too, uh, cover the, the locally the cabinet platform glide uh, along the salt uh, inherited from the prairie stage, late Triassic salt, and we have a huge increase of um, accommodation on the basin. So here we have a look on the transgressive stage recorded by here far field deformation in the Pyrenees that could be linked to the African plate east north east motion. And during late Santonian to early Campanian that we do not have study uh, on the platform. Uh, we have the early orogenic stage with uh, localization of deformation on six skin uh, structure as that allowed to closure the previous basin. Uh, and this is linked to the African plate northward motion. So to finish, if we have a look on uh, the African plate motion throughout the uh, late Cretaceous here, we have the uh, in zero anomalies that correspond to the early Cretaceous, so the end of hyperextension in Pyrenees. And here we have the 34 anomalies that correspond to late Santonian and outset of six skin deformation and compression of on Pyrenees. However, in oh, between these two anomalies, we, yeah, all right. we do not have any anomaly in between these two. So here we record breakup and drifting uh, during Cenomanian to Turonian. And this trend here that is east north east correspond to transpression and far field deformation in Pyrenees, but we do not have a strain localization on six skin structure. But when the trend here take a top uh, towards the north east direction, here we have a localization of deformation on six skin structure and we close uh, the previous basin. And if we have a look on what happened at the scale of the Iberian plate, we have the, the same evidence during Cenomanian to Turonian time. No rest Iberia margin also recalled breakup and, ter and thermal subsidence. During Coniacian and mid Santonian, we have far field deformation on Pyrenees and the no rest Iberia record transpersonal deformation on the distal margin and luckily a few shortening on the proximal margin. And both during late Santonian and early Campanian, the North Pyrenean basin and the Northwest Iberian margin under the compression. The Pyrenean domain was completely closure and the uh, Northwest Iberia margin slightly inverted. So thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. That was um, well-timed, very interesting. Um, so we have so far one question in from, um, from Kathy Hollis, in fact, and uh, she was asking, um, why the subsidence, the Coniacian subsidence is focused in the Tremp Basin, which I think at least one of your plots seemed to indicate. Do you have any, um, can you identify a mechanism or a reason why that would be the case? Um, yeah, in Tremp Basin is a, a little bit different because uh, we have a lot of uh, late Triassic salt. So luckily the map is, um, yeah, we have some mistake because we have overprint of far field deformation that causes uh, an uplift of the platform. But when we have salt cover 
slide towards the north because we have an uplift of the margin and the subsidence of the basin. So luckily, salt control um, uh, the accommodation increase uh, when we have previous slate triassic salt uh, that is uh, uh, on, on the margin. Because during hyperextension, salt glide towards the basin axis and the Jurassic cover um, remain on the center of the basin and the margin is denudated. So the Cretaceous platform grade all up uh, over the, the, the Paleozoic basement, but locally we have huge salt that keep on the margin. And during the late Cretaceous, this salt control locally mini depot center uh, on, on the margin. Ah, so, so underneath Tramp and other areas like it then, was that, was there more subsidence because of salt withdrawal then? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so let me just say, I can't see any other questions, but I, I have a question for you. If you can go to your um, accommodation curves or the subsidence curves that you showed. Yeah. Here, between the margin and the basin. Um, though, yeah, those ones. Okay, so um, do you think it's possible to actually refine those any further and add additional data points so that you begin to resolve, you know, more than one, two, three, there's four, four data points, aren't there, along the x-axis on those plots? Could, do you think it's possible to add more in this case? Uh, where? Just, just more points along the x-axis so that you resolve the way that the, the subsidence rate is changing through time. Uh, I don't know because um, well, biostructic graphical constraint uh, cannot be improved, I, I think, because uh, there have been a lot of work on this and uh, using uh, micro uh, for now, we do not have uh, improved significantly uh, the calibration of timing of uh, the different sequence. And in the basin, um, microphone are very poor, so it's, it's quite difficult. And all the um, key transects uh, available on the uh, Iberian margin have been uh, studied. So I think the transect cannot be uh, improved significantly, and thus the evolution uh, of the curve, um, I think, uh, um, pretty good uh, here. Mm, okay, it's just that you know, in on these kind of subsidence curves, you often see that that subsidence rate accelerates in quite a nice curved type of curve, don't you? On the on the theoretical basin modeling curve, so it'd just be interesting to see whether that was happening here or or whether it's something slightly different. And um, we have another question here. I think we've still got some more time. Um, is there any uh, hard ground uh, or microfaces evidence associated with the Coniacian mid Santonian transgression? And that's from Ismail Omer Yilmaz. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have paleo soil, locally uh, continental deposits, um, Castifar surface, but we have also our ground and uh, a lot of steelite with uh, uh, evidence of uh, immersive cement on the platform. Okay, okay. And uh, another question now from uh, Wakar Ahmad. S um, in the portions of the basin evolution that were rift basins, uh, and I guess this would apply for all of them actually, since since there are you know source areas for siliciclastics throughout. Did you do you see any evidence that carbonate deposition was inhibited by siliciclastic input? Uh, during the Coniacian, we only have clastic on the platform during uh, uh, the in the vicinity of the regressive uh, surface of the Coniacian. So during that time, maybe uh, uh, the uh, the clastic uh, uh, stop uh, the carbonate platform uh, production. But during all the Cenomanian to Turonian, we do not have uh, clast on the platform. And during late Santonian and late Coniacian. Uh, it's the same, we do not have plastic on the platform. So the, the Coniacium was the transpressional period then, is that correct? Yeah, uh, it, it's an hypothesis. So um, we, we do not record how evolved um, 
we know that the every um, African plate change motion be between M0 and 34 anomaly with uh, a transpressive strand. And we think that uh, it's what we see on Cognacian time. We have a far field deformation, so uplift of the margin that correspond to the cold domain inherited from uh, the early Cretaceous hyperextension. We have no burial and a very low thermal gradient around 30 uh, uh, degree per kilometer. But on the basin, we have an increase of subsidence uh, at the same moment because we, we are in an irritated hot place and this is more easy to subside because we have an inherited thermal gradient that is around 60 to 100 degrees per kilometer. And when the thermal gradient is uh, become normal, uh, we localize the deformation during a late Antonian on six skin structure and we can close the basin. Okay. Yeah, I, this, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when you've got so many different things that control what's happening, it's always hard to unravel um, you know, to make an interpretation. And I think what, what I sometimes find a, a little bit um, worrying is when people focus on just the one control and say, oh, it's this, it's this, it must be this. And, you know, you've done a nice job here of showing that there's a lot of different things going on and therefore you need to consider, well, I mean, you could, you could say multiple hypotheses, multiple controls, you know, you, you can't rule things out very easily, can you, even with this level of detail? Yeah. Okay, Nicholas, thank you very much. That was a great thank you presentation. Very much. Good work. We will, um, we will I, if there are any follow on questions, obviously you can pop those in the chat group and um, breakout rooms and so on, and um, we, we can follow those up later. So, next up is, um, let's have a look, Orin Bryars of the University of Manchester, and he's going to talk about seismic scale coral carpets. Do you want to share your slides, Orin? Yeah, hold on one sec. Good morning, everyone. Okay, share that. Okay, you can hear me fine? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, and you can see the screen? Yes. The right screen? Excellent. So can I get started? Okay, yeah, go, 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 go. Cool, okay. So, um, yeah, this work was done at the end of last year in the southwest of Morocco. And uh, just before I probably start, I want to say a coral carpet, for anyone who doesn't know, is uh, corals that grow aerially, they, they don't um, preferentially, preferentially grow upwards, and they don't show internal zonation. So that's what I want to get started. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'll just get straight into it. Uh, why are we doing this study? So this is a, a, a Taminar formation in Morocco. It's a really laterally extensive um, carbonate unit. And it's been kind of poorly documented in the past. And for the scale of it, uh, as a non-refill uh, coral system, I think it's, um, it's quite important that um, it, it, it um, gets an important kind of uh, detailed study. So we want to characterize that. And the, the timing, well, this is a hot Arabian, so low Cretaceous, and coral productivity is, is you know, it's quite low. We're also looking at a mixed carbonate classic system. Uh, so we want to understand the development and demise of the coral carpets uh, during the lowest Cretaceous. And then assess um, how far they may extend, not just Morocco, but perhaps around the Central Atlantic margin. So to do that, we're going to use sedimentology, we're going to build depositional model, and uh, synthesize fieldwork and all available regional data. So just a bit in the context, we are in the Essaouira Agadir Basin in the Mesozoic. We are relatively undeformed sediments in this passive margin. And we're looking at the Hot Arabian, uh, the Taminar Formation to be specific. Uh, that's following the Jurassic upper, uh, the end of the Jurassic where we had that um, shallow carbonate platform. We're moving into general deepening in the lower Cretaceous, but um, there may be a local regression um, in the lower hot Arabian. So we did this uh, field study, as I said, at the end of last year, and we focus on some outcrops in the south of the Essaouira Agadir Basin here. Most of the uh, logs were done here, and uh, with the thickest and the best record actually, um, this number nine. We also wanted to compare that to the other part of the basin where there's more outcrops, um, which is just south of uh, uh, Jebel Amsi 10, which is a, a paleo high, as is Cap Rear. 
and that would be to be able to compare the two uh, sections on the other sides of the basin. So we're looking now in the south section in Igarar, just to get an idea of the, ge the large scale geometries. We've got this uh, overall some slight deformation uh, from the Alpine origin, we, we think. You've got this uh, lower limestone unit and then this uh, Marley limestones in between before you get to the big obvious um, carbonate unit. And that is uh, overlain by a thin layer of uh, clastics before you go into a deepening sequence above that. Uh, and looking, in a, well, this is, I suppose, a basinward direction now, um, east to west, uh, you can see that big carbonate unit that eventually appears to disappear uh, several kilometers away. You've got the aggregating unit above that, and uh, this is a Boozer Goon formation above, which is um, slightly younger and uh, clastics. But yeah, you can you can see you've got that big unit. Uh, the lower units are quite discontinuous. You can't really tell so much in the photo, but they, it's not nearly as obvious as that big unit of limestones that uh, disappears actually as you move towards uh, the west. And now I'm going to show. Um, we found this really good section uh, at Tama Nine, and it basically is the, the best record of the, the full succession of the Tamanar. So we start with um, this pioneer coral growth. We've got small and low diversity, usually mud rich matrix. Uh, it's overall discontinuous uh, deposition across the shelf. We don't find this unit um, in all the sections. And as I say, the corals are small. There's clearly been some sort of change in the environment that's allowed some corals to appear. It's the first time in the Cretaceous we see any. So we start with this, um, this unit, and that's followed by uh, this transgressive unit, which is bioclassic limestones and marls with some oysters, uh, oyster-based limestones before we get to this marl. And uh, we come to this next carbonate unit, which is uh, this, uh, sequence number three, uh, which is pr the most interesting kind of part of the study. So we have these large domo corals, we've got flat platy morphologies, it's a bit more diverse than before, and they're, they're, they're physically they're bigger. We don't see any internal zonation. Uh, the beds maintain their, um, their thickness. They, they can be quite thin, you know, 10 to 20 centimetres, but also up to, you know, 700 centimetres, but they show similar thickness and no internal zonation. We also see things like uh, Lithocodium aggregatum, which is a micron cluster, and that can indicate moderate environmental stress. And there's quite a, a significant amount of quartz in the matrix, so suggesting there's some sort of circulation going on in this uh, kind of far more extensive coral, uh, coral unit. And that's um, overlain by a transgressive surface, um, well, this hard ground surface, followed by a thin unit of limestones uh, and some more oyster lag deposits. And that's then um, overlain by some sandstones and silty, sand, silty beds where the corals are, are no longer observed. So the sands are laterally extensive, it can be, can be quite thin, the unit can be down to you know, 20, 30 centimetres and uh, up to several, several metres as seen here. And we expect their shore face deposits based on the, uh, the wavy cross lamination, the, the orientation of shower fragments and the, the sharp base. And this is where the corals are disappeared. And the, the kind of study interval ends with this uh, series of oyster, oyster beds. Uh, and we also move into um, some limestones with ammonites, which allowed us to constrain it to still a lower hotter ravine. Uh, and that's where we end the study before we go into the beryllium. So we've got this aggrading unit. And just to quickly show you, I don't want to spend much time on this, just to show you the, what it's like in the north. Uh, things are generally quite deformed um, from the Atlassic origin, but what we see is we can identify similar depositional packages. And we also can see we've got the, the corals uh, in similar places. We've got the first unit of corals, we've got that, that, um, that third more obvious unit. And we've got a thin unit of classics on top. But the, the preservation isn't amazing here because of the uh, deformation after the Cretaceous. But I just want to show you how we have two similar packages. Uh, quite far, 40 kilometers odd uh, off the shelf. So uh, now I just want to show you some log correlations using some tentative sequence stratigraphy and the sedimentology done. Uh, so the 
what the main points here I want to show is we're looking from um, southeast to west, so roughly in a basinward direction. We've got that lower discontinuous unit here, followed by that transgressive unit, and then that main um, limestone, well, coral rich limestone. Uh, and as you see, it actually pinches, appears to, appears to disappear uh, towards here, whereas the units above actually continue. Uh, so there's something controlling perhaps the corals at that point, may that be depth or perhaps light factors. Uh, and what we also see is there's some lateral fascist changes on quite local local scales. So this suggests there's maybe autogenic factors going on. This shelf is quite, is generally flat and quite wide. So I think there's some environmental factors that are contributing to different lateral uh, fascist changes. And then looking uh, north to south on the, uh, that same area, uh, a bit harder to correlate because there's a lot of quaternary erosion here, but we've got that lower discontinuous unit and then the upper unit, I think, I believe that this is actually this, the second unit here and that this, this disappears uh, and some more lateral fascist changes and um, probably do have autogenic factors. And then looking on a regional scale, we, uh, so this is the uh, Amsterdam log I showed you. This is the one I went through in detail, Igarar. This is in a motion that is uh, uh, based on previous field work I've done um, for another uh, project, uh, more to do with biostratigraphy, but I've logged that section before. And what I see is that we have this second unit of limestone here and here, over 40 kilometers almost. Uh, but what we don't have at this section in a motion is this uh, lower unit. Uh, so this is just to show you basically how, you know, over almost 40 kilometers, we've got these kind of genetic, genetically related packages. And what also we see here is that the, um, the strata um, is pinching out towards these paleo highs. There's no deposition during the Lower Hot Caribbean at Cap Rear or Amsterdam. So let's take that um, forward and then look at a depositional model. And this is based on my work, based on the um, available published publish work and kind of everything that I thought would be useful. So we've got these paleo highs, Amsterdam here, that's um, at Cap Rear, uh, and that's uh, in Muzer, which is, you can't see in, in the previous uh, work. So what we're starting with is this initial coral growth. We've got kind of patch and deposition uh, and some lateral facies changes. And at this point, I think there must be some sort of shift in climate or sea level and or water circulation um, after the upper Valanginian that's allowed some corals to exist. Uh, we then have that first coral demise uh, with a, a transgression. Uh, and then we have that main coral event. Uh, so we've got a far more uh, widespread deposition of corals and some lateral fat use uh, variations also. And then we have that hard ground, red marker bed, and deep position of thin miles of bioclastic limestones. Before that, um, clastic influx, which I think uh, puts an end to the corals, and that may be associated with sediment shedding from active paleo highs in the um, inland. And then we have the drowning of the shelf with that grading unit. That ends the study. And just, uh, just to quickly say about the scale, so we found the corals here in outcrop. We also expect it is slightly um, further out of a uh, modern coastline. Uh, in the subsurface, we see we've got this also in the Turfaya, 500 kilometers southwest. But building on that, we also think we have, um, we've got the center Atlantic margin with these carbonate um, platforms growing. They may well exist um, further afield. Um, so recent work by Cass and et al. has shown thick lateral continuous carbonate platforms uh, elsewhere. So they, they might not just be in Morocco, but they might actually exist um, on a bigger scale. So just to conclude, we've got uh, this characterized formation of these Sclectinian corals um, with no clear internal zonation. We've uh, built the research model, um, suggested the corals might have formed with multiple factors the demise might have been to do with a classic influx, uh, and we have thickness variations controlled by the topography that was there before in the Jurassic, but autogenic factors might have controlled the, the um, lateral uh, local factory changes, and they might exist um, further afield than just Morocco. So thank you very much. I think I was a bit over there, but <laughs> apologies. Only, only a few seconds are, and that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, Great.
I am not seeing any questions coming through yet. So if you do have any questions to ask, or and now's the time to type them and um, share them with everybody when you do. But I, I can ask you a couple of questions, Aaron. Um, Please. If you go back to one of the slides that showed your the different faces on the platform top for your depositional model, can you just pop that? Pop that. Uh, yeah, there. Yeah, that that one. Yeah, that one. That's a good one. Right. So, do you think there is enough? laterally discontinuous faces enough evidence for that that you would call this a faces mosaic or would you say that you've got linear faces belts i mean i see these are sinuous belts because they will at this time i think they form where they can you know so if you've got this large wide um relatively flat shelf then the coral carpet will form you know as as far as as they as they can you know um, probably that will be limited to light, you know, and therefore the depth um, and other factors in involving right. environment. But on, on, on that plot, you, on that diagram, that cartoon, you show um, that it, the, the corals are laterally discontinuous, don't you? Yeah, I, I think I've, I've tried to show that it's not like an, an entire blank on the, on the shelf, like it is 50 by 50 kilometers squared. I mean, if you consider one of these blobs, to be, not scientifically correct, but the, one of these kind of um, these these belts, that that is, they're you know several kilometres wide and tens of kilometres long. If you see an outcrop, you, that is, it's really quite significant in size. I don't think they would be covering completely, you know, um, all the way from um, you know number four here, which is a, a, in the most inland extent we have of uh, evidence of these corals, out to Amsterdam. You know, I don't think there'll be a complete blanket, but there's... No, 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 no. Okay, but, but I mean, it would be very surprising if there was, in fact. But any, anyway, there's a few more questions coming through now. So, um, Clement Pollier has asked, has there been any isotope analysis on the scleractinian corals to give clues to the climate and environment in which they grew? So, yeah, that's, that's a really good question and something we are considering doing. So, I haven't done that yet. But, uh, and something I didn't mention in that talk is a lot of these beds are highly cemented and um, they've got quite significant diagenetic overprint. So currently unsure as I haven't actually, haven't actually decided if I'm going to do, I still work on uh, specifically these corals. Um, in my other project, in the Biostrap project, I might be doing um, a diagenetic log through all of, you know, um, the end of the Jurassic up to the Lower Hotter River and that would encompass them perhaps okay. shine some light on this but at this stage um, not currently no um, okay. is there an, a question from Alex Brazier is there any correlation between the number of coral species and the percentage of siliciclastic sediment the siliciclastic input through time can you can you define a correlation well when you consider this widespread coral growth when I looked at thin sections, you've got, you know, 10 to 15 percent is usually quartz. So there is some sort of um, classic in these corals are actually, you know, they're surviving. They, they have some sort of tolerance to plastics. But obviously, when you go to uh, this here, we don't have any corals because it, well, it appears that the classics have actually can, you know, covering the whole shelf, and there seems to be that they cannot survive. But after I think that. Alex is maybe yeah. suggesting that if you count the number of species, the different number of species, you may find that's useful information because presumably they have different sensitivities to the environmental factors, and you might begin to see some patterns. Yeah, I can consider that. And um, so, I mean, the, in terms of the corals themselves, we do just have these uh, scleractinians of different morphologies. Mm. It's quite hard to actually differentiate the different species because of the the, um, the preservation. So what we see is morphological variations of scleractinians. Uh, but I will, I will look into that. That could be useful. So thank you. Related to that, Rachel Wood has said, are the coral carpets composed of many species or very few? So I think, you know, maybe you could do some more work breaking down into genera or species of corals present, and that might give you some... Yeah. Um, I mean, if you compare to other coral systems, the diversity is low. You know, we're talking tens, tens of species, really. So no, it's not it's not high diversity, but that maybe says a lot about the environment and why they survive right. on the shelf. 
um, and and then I'm trying to go through these in order. I don't think we're going to get through them all, so we'll want to follow them up. <laughs> perhaps. But uh, Ismail uh, Yilmaz has said, "Age. Uh, what is the age of the hard ground surface, and does it correlate? Um, I think he's saying, does it correlate across the platform?" Okay, so yeah, I, I probably forgot to mention that we find that same hard ground at both at number so up here and down here, and that age is Lower Hotter Ravine. Uh, we have read well. I, I'm actually the biostrap project I'm doing will further constrain that that hard ground because we have ammonites above it, so we'll be able to know exactly where we are there. And um, we, we suggest this low water ravine because of preliminary work. And below the Taminar formation, these corals we know is the base of the hotter ravine, so we have quite a tight constraint on the um, age. You can't beat a good biostrap project, can you? No, you, you can't. No. So we have another one here. Um, Pankaj Khanna, the shelf margin was characterized by um, modern analogs of coral carpets. I think asking whether, well, whether anything was happening particularly on the shelf margin, I guess, which is a good question. You might yeah, it, and it's, I'd, I'd, I'm interested too. The problem is, is in Morocco, you've got quite a lot of deformation on the actual, on the break. So you've got this data gap really right now. And, uh, the next data I have is DSTP well, 100 and something kilometers to the, the northwest. We've got significant um, sediment um, contribution actually during this time, uh, which is why I put in these um, schematics here. Uh, but yeah, at, at the time, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, with what's happening on that margin and how far it extends. Could These carpets could actually extend, you know, right out to a, a postulated uh, shelf break. So they might be sense of um, off modern modern day coastline. They might become basin floor tiles then if they go right into the basin. Um, I think I mean more. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I think we should probably stop there and get on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was a great. Right, thank you. And lots of questions. I think that people will want to follow up with you in in the, the breakout sessions or, or um, sets online forum. Okay, and uh, please go ahead. Okay, uh, hi there. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmed Qayyib. Uh, my supervisor are John Howell and Alexander Breiser. I'm from uh, Saudi Arabia. I am in the early stage of uh, my PhD at uh, University of Aberdeen. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a 3D outcrop and uh, laboratory study of a Jurassic carbonate ramp, the Hanifa Formation uh, Central of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, here is the outline of my presentation that I will go through the introduction of uh, Hanifa Formation and uh, give a brief of uh, geological uh, history of Hanifa Formation and the location of my uh, study area and then move to uh, data and uh, method that I'm going to use for my PhD and then uh, deposition interpretation of uh, Hanifa Formation and the next uh, future work and last the conclusion. So the introduction why is Hanifa formation, uh, one of the most important unit of the late Jurassic uh, in, Saudi, in, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia and also the upper Jurassic strata are the most productive oil reservoir specifically in Saudi Arabia and generally in the world. In addition, there is a limited previous published work uh, on outcrops analogs, especially in the uh, south uh, area, because it's a little bit dangerous and there is a, 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 that's a rough road to arrive to the exposures and the outcrops built. But uh, my uh, supervisors and I, we love to be in this adventure. However, the uh, goal of my beach project is determine the uh, depositional environment at the range uh, of a scale and uh, and the end of uh, uh, and the range of a scale in uh, different scales of or uh, fashion to scale to so, uh, you can hear me 
Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, to determine the dosage requirement in different scale from fashion to scale to uh, wadi outcrop scale and log scale and the hand specimen scale. And uh, the end of my uh, PhD project, I believe to understand the sequence of uh, stratigraphy of Hanif formation in high resolution. Uh, the geological uh, history, uh, that you can see here the map of the uh, Arabian blade. The sedimentary rocks of the Jurassic were deposited in uh, st uh, stable uh, passive margin, uh, st uh, passive margin uh, that extend from the from the uh, eastern edge of the Arabian Shield to the Zagros Mountain uh, in Iran, and the aesthetic sea level uh, raise and the subsidence, uh, the continuous subsidence is the major. Uh, are the major uh, growth of the Hanifa formation. Uh, stratigraphy, uh, stratigraphy of the Hanifa formation, the Hanifa formation laid above the Tuwaiq mountain limestone and the contact between the Tuwaiq uh, mountain, uh, mountain limestone and the Hanifa formation is baroconformity uh, surface. And above the Hanifa formation is uh, the Jubela formation, that's the contact between them is disconformity surface. Also, uh, also the Hanifa formation uh, divided into two member. The lower part uh, is Al Hota, that's dominated by ammonite and argillaceous limestone, and the upper part dominated by Al Ulaya, dominated by uh, uh, formanifera and corals. And here is the, uh, the location of my study area that's in uh, uh, south of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And we zoom in the two section of uh, Wadi Al Ain that I did a log in, and the picture of the uh, outcrops from where I collect my sample from the section one. Uh, data and the, uh, the method uh, that I'm going to use in my PhD that I, 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 I just I studied earth uh, section in Wadi Al Ain and two of them I just uh, do two detailed log and the total uh, about 300 samples were collected from the field and from these uh, samples as a traditional work we can provide the sedimentary logs uh, and uh, petrography labs and uh, geochemistry so you can understand the value uh, environment and the diagenesis. And uh, the advanced, advanced uh, methods that I'm going to use that the virtual outcrops that I'm going to show you uh, in the next slide. The virtual outcrops, uh, that's example the outcrop, a 3D outcrop that we can understand and interpret the, uh, the outcrop in big scale and in really high resolution and we can trace all the uh, bits together and uh, for example if we have section in the uh, proxima and and the section in the middle we can correlate between them very easily and, and uh, here's the uh, outgroup of the section one that i will show you the next slide the look of the uh, this outcrop. Uh, here, as you can see in the uh, log, the, in the base of the log, the, uh, we, uh, we have limestone, a uh, thin bit of limestone with a different grain size from mudstone to uh, backstone. And the middle part and the upper part is dominated by uh, refill uh, faces. And in the middle part, uh, the coral heads sized from uh, medium to uh, small to, sorry, to from small to medium, and in the upper part from uh, medium to uh, large coral head size. And uh, here's the outcrop from where I collect the sample for section two. Uh, as you can see here, the, the bids here in the look, uh, in the section two is, the bids is much thinner than uh, section one, and that's give a little bit indication for uh, the section uh, two is a little bit deeper than uh, section one. And as uh, we zoom in some bits, we can see all the thin bits of limestone with a different grain size. 
and uh, also uh, in the up, uh, middle part and the upper part, they're thin bedded of uh, package of limestone with a different size from um, uh, mud stone to uh, grain uh, stone. So the interpretation uh, of the decision, as you can see here, the 2D uh, depositional model uh, that identified, uh, we identified uh, four uh, uh, faces uh, that extend from the mid ram to uh, the outer ram. Uh, the future work, uh, that's from the samples were collected from the field that we can use it for in the lab for petrography and geochemistry that will improve our interpretation and uh, understand the diagenesis. Uh, so uh, then we can use this data to provide a 3D depositional model of the Hanifa formation and then move to create a 3D reservoir model and then and, uh, understand the sequence stratigraphy of uh, Hanifa formation in high resolution. Um, the conclusion, uh, the Hanifa formation was deposit in uh, shallow marine carbonate lab environment. Uh, four fishes association have been defined in Wadi uh, Al section based upon sedimentary structure and uh, fossils. Uh, laboratory study uh, uh, as a petrographic and uh, geochemistry uh, analysis will improve our environmental uh, interpretation. A 3D uh, virtual outcrops will be used to map uh, sediment body geometry and architecture. This will be placed in a sequence stratigraphic framework determined from logs and regional study. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, thank the Ministry of Education and King of Aziz University uh, in Saudi Arabia for the financial support during my study period. And also I would like to thank Safari Project for their support uh, too. I would like to thank Prof. Amar Amin and uh, Dr. Faisal Gahtani from King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia for their support and prepare all uh, that we needed to make the field trip uh, successful. A specific thanks to Prof. Muhammad Khalil uh, from King Abdulaziz University for his help in the field. Uh, thanks for General Authority of Civil Aviation that gave uh, us the permission uh, and allowed us to fly the drone in uh, Saudi Arabia. Thank you. That's great, Ahmed. Thank you. No need for your two-minute warning. You were very, um, very quick there. So um, the the chat is open for questions. I'm sure they'll come in and is a as a flood. But um, can I just start with one then, Ahmed? A very general question. When you say this is a ramp, um, do you base that just on existing literature interpretations or do you see things in the outcrops that you've studied that would you know, confirm that, that it's a ramp and not a flat top platform, for example? Yeah, uh, that's uh, from like a previous, uh, lit limited previous study uh, in, the, uh, in the area and uh, also uh, there is no much like topographics uh, and uh, much structure uh, that show us like the, we are like in the shell for the rim uh, platforms. Uh, also, the, uh, for the uh, <coughs> the refill faces, we have just a few uh, meters uh, of the uh, refill faces. We don't have like a big wall of uh, uh, faces or color faces that that indicate us that we are in the shelf or in the uh, rimmed platform. Hmm. Okay, so there's a few questions coming in now. Um, let's have a look. Uh, ben Bio Song has said, can the inner ramp deposition be traced in this outcrop area? So I think he's asking, are the faces that you see characteristic of an inner ramp setting? You mean in the virtual outcrops? Yeah, the, the, the outcrops that you're showing here, are they, do you think they're characteristic of an inner ramp setting? Um, actually, this, this is uh, now is like under process. Uh, we just start for uh, the, uh, for this one, we didn't interpret yet, but I believe that's, uh, yes, we can uh, do this. 
and you can't rest and correlate between the, uh, all the uh, uh, outcrops built uh, in the wadi, in the whole wadi. Okay, um, let's have a look what else we've got then. Um, so I'm just trying to, to, some of these we've already kind of addressed. Um, so some of these, uh, let's have a look. Uh, Hossein Judah is asking, what is the source rock of the Hanifa formation reservoirs? So I think it's, is there a source rock interval under here or over the top somewhere else? Or what, 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 is, what is the source rock in the petroleum system? And the petroleum system, uh, uh, the Hanifa formation, the, uh, the upper part of the Jurassic is the, the reservoir. But uh, in the uh, north uh, of, uh, of the Hanifa formation, that I believe is the source, uh, the source rock in the petroleum system. Okay. And uh, then there's a, the Ai Wei Zoo is asking, why is Uid Grainstone interpreted as a mid-ramp environment? I think you perhaps made that interpretation on one of your slides. Uh, the division and model of the oolitic grain stone. Oh yeah, okay. So you've got you've got an oolitic grain stone there as a lower shore face mid ramp. Mm -hmm. In the distal of the lower shore face. Okay, but I think I th I guess the question is suggesting that maybe it would be an, an alternative interpretation would be that it would yeah. be an inner ramp higher energy setting perhaps. <clears throat> yep, yep, but uh, just because this is like in the early stage, uh, that uh, I, uh, we have uh, three main wadis, and uh, that's so far just from the Wadi Ain and uh, two detailed log. Uh, that's maybe in the next uh, work with the petrographic work that will give uh, more uh, indication of the uh, environment. But that's uh, just based on the sedimentary structure and uh, the fossils in the field. That's uh, I built this model. Okay. Um, and uh, Mohammed Awe has asked, what are the different ranges of scales at which you will um, establish the depositional environment for the Hanifa formation? So, you, you, I mean, presumably you're going to do it for each outcrop, but you're going to try and synthesize into a larger scale view of the depositional environment? Uh, yes, this is like uh, in the, in the, in the uh, future for the next work, yeah, we can uh, get like the big scale and the big load for the, for the, all the sections. Okay, and let's see what else have we got here. Um, Danish Khan has said, what kind of traps are there for hydrocarbon accumulation? I think pre presumably in this area, is, is there anything do you think that might be prospective? Uh, actually, this is the good questions, but uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, I don't uh, know right now for uh, the answer for these questions. Uh, and you probably shouldn't tell us if you did. Um, uh, okay, sure. I think that is, oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, okay, There's, we've got uh, three minutes left for questions. So if anybody else has any question remaining, now is the time. <clears throat> Let's just give that a few seconds. How fast can somebody type? Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, this is a good one. At what scale can you resolve orbital cycles oh, in the Hanifa formation and what is the impact on deposition and facies? Uh, the deposition uh, the deposition and model. The sound. So may, maybe that will come out in your sequence strat analysis. Then I guess when you'll yeah, start. Yeah, start yeah, that's that. the we could be that's we are in the like in the early stage right now. Yeah. So maybe that's we can uh, improve it in the next uh, step and uh, at the end of uh, end of the PhD. That's I think it will be answered. Wow, it's a special thing to look forward to then. And finally, we have a, a return to the ramp question from Mohammed Awe. Why haven't you called the carbonate platform um, 
a shelf rather than a ramp. I think he's still um, curious about why you think this is a ramp and not a flat top platform. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, as I say, this is like the early stage and uh, interpretation and uh, maybe in the next uh, work, uh, we can improve if this shelf or uh, uh, ramp, but uh, that's just the, the early stage of the, the study. Okay, so it's definitely a tricky question. Okay, one one final one, uh, Denise <clears throat> Khan. What is yep. the cementation type in the in the Hanifa formation? Have you? I guess you haven't really done any diagenetic stuff. Uh, yeah, not yeah, not yet. It's just uh, I start uh, the field work in uh, December, so just uh, a few months for just for uh, for the interpretation. Um, but yeah, and. Uh, I hope in the next uh, uh, stages we can uh, start for the uh, bitterography work so, so understand the diagenesis and improve the uh, uh, environment interpretation. Yeah, so loads, loads of questions for you to work on, Ahmed, from the audience. I think that's, that's useful, isn't it? So let's, let's wrap up now then. Um, so that's the end of the session. Thank you all for... for um, for, for being there, being out there. Uh, one good. announcement that we need to make, um, the, the presenters for the next session, you should expect an invitation into the green room during the break where you can uh, test your microphones, videos, load your slides up and make sure they're working and, and so on. So please watch out for that. Um, I guess if you've got any questions related to any of the talks that have just happened, you can follow up with the, with the presenters now and um, I guess I need to then hand back over to somebody else because it's the end of the session.